Hey everyone, it's Jen Runyon, Chief Editor of Renewable Energy World. And Paula Mitz, Chief Market Research Analyst, SPV Market Research. And it's time for 3 at 3 on Solar PV again. Live from SPI. That's right. Here we are in SPI. So we're going to talk about three topics for three minutes each. Our topics today are going to be SPI, since here we are. We're going to be talking about uh, the solar brand. Solar brand. And energy storage, residential energy storage. Absolutely. All right, let's start with SPI. What are your initial impressions? Wow, you know, uh, it's big. <laughs> it's probably the biggest trade show in the U.S. for solar. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my opinion, that's its strength. I've noticed some of the conference sessions are a little sparsely attended, particularly one on PURPA yesterday. PURPA is quite important. We can talk about that maybe in another another episode. But uh, so again, big, lots of people wandering around, uh, exhibit hall well attended, exhibitors talking about the, lots of traffic. I'm not sure, I don't think a lot of deals get done here, but certainly networking is a strength. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I actually thought it seemed a little sparser in the halls yesterday. I spent all my time on the trade show wow. floor, and um, the one thing that people kept saying is, well, it is spread out. It's in three different locations this year, so there's two different expo halls and a micro, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah a microgrid outside section that I didn't get to yet. So that might be why it's feeling a little less attended well, but I don't know. Sure. You know, I don't know the official numbers yet. You know, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it because I don't know the official numbers. I'm just talking to people. I haven't really done much of the haul yet. I'll be doing that a little bit today and I'm going to a solar wedding in the uh, storage, energy storage pavilion. But I have heard some people talking about the fact that it's a little bit too spread out and it, it's just, it's difficult to get from one place to another. So maybe what we used to be a strength that this was the biggest trade show in the U.S. for solar is not so much a strength anymore? Well, right. If they, I, I believe that's what happened. They grew, yeah. they grew too big for the space they, they had. Yeah. Um, and yet next year they're at Mandalay Bay. I don't know where the exhibitors will we'll go see. then. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. All right. Moving on. The solar brand. What, what do you have to say about the solar brand? Well, my session is today on September 14th at 1 o'clock. Anybody who's watching this, which is going to be afterwards, so you won't have come. Anyway, um, you know, I'm not sure we actually have a solar brand, and that's what we're going to be talking about this session. So a brand is you're emotionally connected to it. End users, our customers are emotionally connected to, like, to the Nike swoosh, for example. Okay. Or unfortunately in our industry, Solyndra came briefly a brand for us. And my topic at this session is or was about you know engaging the end users. Uh, they're not just our customers. If we just focus on selling them something or leasing them something, at the end of the day we actually lose an important part of our industry. We need to emotionally engage people in solar and make it so they are on our side as we move forward in our fight in the U.S. net metering. Um, it, it's so the solar brand, I just don't think it's established. I think the reason that it's a good topic here is that nobody really knows what the solar brand is. Well, so do you mean like the brand, you know, industry brand, industry brand. brand. So the whole solar. So you don't care about the individual brands. Oh, I of, care. Well, I no, care no, deeply. But I mean, <laughs> well, so no, I'm asking because I've had, yeah. we at Renewable Energy World have had a module maker who's interested in um, they, they don't sell directly to residential, but they want to, and so the, and they want your customers to specify their brand. So they're actually interested in creating a case study with us, looking at a residential oh. homeowner that did request their panel, which is it's just not really done. Most people don't really even know what panels they have on their house if they have some. Well, actually not entirely true. Um, you remember a couple of years ago I did a really big residential study and before that I've always done spot checks of the residential market and end users. So one company that did this really well was SunPower. Years and years ago they spent a lot of money uh, on radio advertising and television advertising that went directly to end users. And end users for a while, I, I remember specifically being in the store, this is about three years ago in line and the person behind me was talking to someone else about wanting to 
the solar. And the other person said, oh, you mean sun power. Really? So it's name recognition. It was KQED that, you know, there was, again, there was solar, it was sun power, sun power, sun power, making it synonymous with solar. And it actually did work to a degree, and we don't do enough of it. I know that also LG uh, has gotten some traction where end users requested, so it can be done. It can be done. So, but, but how does that relate to or does it have anything to do with what you're talking about? It solar. does and it doesn't at the same time. I mean, so the solar brand is going to be, or it should be, we should have a brand as an industry. So natural gas now is clean. They, they spend a lot of money in the natural gas industry to make it clean, which as we know it isn't. In the solar industry, what money, we don't, you know, we complain that we don't have the money to do this, but if we engage everybody, all the end users in our brand, in an emotional connection to our brand, we're going to have a lot more political clout in terms of lobbying, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It'll be better for the individual brands. So like a Got Solar thing. Exactly. But, you know, get it. I would actually say the Nike swoosh is probably better because though I personally don't think there's that much difference in shoes, <laughs> but Pete, there's an emotional resonance to have uh, Jordan whatever his brand was, it's not my thing, but there is an emotional resonance. There's a movie about this, actually. It's, a, it's an independent film about a young boy who's very poor and thinks that he will be accepted if he has this special pair of shoes, and indeed it does get him some cachet. We need that connection. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that that's a good idea. I, mean, yep. I think that makes a lot of sense. So. We should do that. Should we should that do out. that. Who we should. should. What? I mean, well, like a SIA job, do you think? I think it's uh, Cal, uh, actually CalSIA has its solar citizens, okay. uh, which I'm not pronouncing correctly, but everybody can go to Cal, uh, CalSIA website and figure it out. Citizens. Okay. And that's direct outreach to the end users. Mm -hmm. Um, but it actually is as simple when you lease a system or you sell a system. You remember that you congratulate the owner, the lessee. You bring them into the industry. You say, welcome to our industry. You keep in touch with them. You send them a newsletter so that the next time there's a state with a net metering fight, they're engaged because it really matters to them. Right, right. And I own a Subaru, and I get the Subaru magazine. Exactly. Maybe, a, maybe we need to launch one. A maybe we do. A magazine or something. It, you know, that is a really good idea. I mean, there's sort of lots of offshoots of magazines that aren't really directed at helping end users understand the solar industry. And there's little things people do, but, you know, and, and there's Calcia's movement, and there's a lot of discussion about it. But at the end of the day, we need more, I mean, first of all, it's the right thing to do. When they lease a system, buy a system, uh, buy a piece of a community solar system, whatever they're doing, they are one of us. Yeah. It's the right thing to do, and come political, um, times of trial and, and you know we need them we need, we need, we need the numbers okay all right good well we have to move on because we're beyond our three minutes got it topic, but it's sorry such a about that topic. it is so last thing is energy storage so residential energy storage i mean i just wrote an article about this it's really not a market in the u.s not yet there is a market in australia there is, interestingly enough, I spent some time working uh, with Arena, in, which is uh, Australia's DOE, sort of. That's a bad analogy. And so I've had a lot of sort of up close and personal discussion about what's going on in Australia. That was um, incentive driven. The dry, you know, they're about a gigawatt a year. So it was incentive driven, and the market has slowed a little bit right now. It was the drive for storage, it's interesting in, in Australia, not a huge market again, is primarily because they really do dislike their utilities way more than people dislike them in, in this country. Yeah, <laughs> well, and their, their prices are really high. I mean, their prices are really high. high. So if you can make solar and use it yourself, I mean, I had a meeting with Enphase yesterday who was claiming they've sold 70,000. They have orders for 70,000 units of their new battery, their residential battery. So that's a lot. That's a big number. Um, and I hope I got that right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was 70,000, but I can double check. Well, you either made it big, you got it right. It's like the three bears. It's too big, it's just right, or it's too small. Someone will bring it up. <laughs> Someone will correct me. And yeah, I'll, exactly. I'll correct it in the notes if it's wrong. But, um, but yeah, so that's that's a big market. They're also they said they were eyeing Hawaii, another 
probably a good idea. What do you think? Well, you know, again, the, it, it, ha it works best in a place where not only are the electricity rates very high, but there's also an unstable grid. Um, it, it works way less well in the U.S. because there's a stable grid. Because the grid is our Exactly. So there are, and with uh, with net metering, back to the need to, for consumer branding, right, and bringing them into our tent with net metering essentially dead in Hawaii, really it, it makes sense now if you're going to go solar to have storage because... You use it. Yeah, you, you, you want the benefit of using your own power. You want to control your costs, etc. It's still a bit on the expensive yeah. side. Mm -hmm. It's meaning that likely if it's affordable, the margins are very, very thin, yeah. and companies are quiet about that. We can't go on being in a low margin industry, but right now it's in its nascent stages, so it's going to have to be affordable, yet with margins that support a thriving industry. Not a lot of research has been done. There's going to be safety studies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really early days. But in, um, I know when I was at the IEEE this year that I actually had a, a parent fan base from REW, my writing, that would come up and show me copies of my article. And a couple were from Hawaii. Somebody was from somewhere else in the U.S., I forget. And they were talking about they had purchased storage for their home system. The reason was where they were, the electricity prices were high, net metering wasn't favorable, they didn't like their utilities. I'm not trying to bash utility, but it is a big reason people do want storage. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, right. In my opinion, it's kind of a race. So if storage becomes low enough and solar customers decide to just get storage and really not use the grid you know the net metering battle goes away because they're not on the grid it's uh it's not going to be a preponderance of the i mean it's not going to grow like booming overnight i don't think no, but no, it's, it, it's going to take a long time but it is changing the paradigm yeah and it starts to disrupt the volatility variability for us as a resource mm -hmm. uh, argument, so example, in the PURPA session yesterday, they were, actually, she was technically incorrect when she was describing, you know, the ver the variability of solar. I mean, oh, yeah. yes, it's a variable resource, and yes, the duck curve is a real thing, but, you know, there's it's a, it's a little bit more complicated than you spelling it. Okay. But she was discussing curtailment. Now, storage does start to disrupt that. Yes, it does. And it, pay, it plays in our favor. It's in our best interest for storage to develop. Yeah. It's in the best interest of our industry also for it to be a higher margin so that these developers and manufacturers survive than, than what it is for module manufacturers. Yeah, of course. We say of course, but... But right, it, it's going to take a while. <laughs> costs, I mean, real material costs have to come down, production costs, all that kind of stuff. And people still be able need to be able to uh, bring a margin. And if... I'm not going to name any country in general, but if a large flood of modules come into a country at below the cost of production, where everybody then has to fight to the bottom, and then that's that is real, that is accepted as the standard price, the price that's already too low. If that happens to storage, well, you're talking really about this is different from developing a solar panel. That is a chemistry experiment. Right. There is some, you know, let's look at Samsung's recall. Danger. There, are, there is some danger there. We really need not to suck the margin out of that industry. That's very true. All right, and with that, we have to end because we've gone way over time. Oh boy! But thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Bye. Three at three on Solar PV. Bye bye.